Welcome. The next three weeks is going to be a little bit different for y'all. This is going to be some out-of-the-box things that have to do with God's revelation of himself. First, today, in the creation of the universe. Next week, in the creation of the world around us, including... And finally, on Palm Sunday, we're going to look at God's revelation in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So we start with the obvious question, I think, and that is, what is God's revelation? Well, first of all, it's God making himself known to man. Revelation is God's act of disclosure. It's not our discovery. Second, revelation is an act of grace because God takes the initiative. It's a gift of his relational knowledge, not forced knowledge, compelling belief, an important concept in today's discussion. Revelation is a process of communication by both word and deed made to man as rational beings created in his image and therefore we have the capacity to see his revelation. And scripture is revelation in history. Revelation is made through particular space-time occurrences which have universal significance for all people in all times. Therefore, revelation is also historical. But revelation is one story. Creation and redemption are partners in this story. Revelation in the things that have been made makes us aware of God, but it does not of itself bring us into relationship with him. Only Jesus does that. So it's one story in two parts. Let's start where it seems to me we have to start, and that is where we are today in considering this. We are on holy ground. Richard Dawkins said one time, you know, Richard Dawkins is the famous atheist. He said one time, very few things that he said that I actually agree with. He said, if there's a God, it's going to be a whole lot bigger and a whole lot more incomprehensible than any theologian of any religion has ever proposed. And he's right about that. And I want to take a detour right now to talk about Moses and his encounter with God. You'll recall that Moses was born in Egypt, raised in Egypt for the first 40 years of his life. Uh, he came to live in Midian, married his wife Zipporah, and for, he was there for 40 years, and then something happened. So we're talking about an 80-year-old Moses who is out toward the west of where he was, was living, and he was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, and he's walking next to Mount Oreb, and he sees something that's strange. He sees a bush that's burning, but it's not being consumed. So he goes up to the bush, and he hears this. God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. Now, in, in the Middle East, the double use of a name is a term of endearment. So God is setting Moses at ease right now. Moses, Moses, that's, there's nothing to be afraid of. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you stand is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. This is Moses' first encounter with God. Um, and it's actually the only place in the Bible, other than Stephen's recount of it in Acts 7, where the ground is declared to be holy. So God says, I've got a job for you. I want you to get the children of Israel out of Egypt, so I'm going to send you down to Egypt. And Moses responds, not atypical for, for that situation. He says, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to him? He puts the issue of name to God. Now understand, in the Middle East, a name 
has significance beyond just something you call somebody. A name has essence. It captures the character of the person you're talking about, not necessarily a person. It captures the character of everything. So, for instance, there's a town in Israel called Gibeah. Gibeah means hill. Gibeah is on a hill. You know the story of Esau. Esau means hairy. Esau was hairy. So he is asking God what his name is, and God responds, God said to Moses, Haya. Haya is the verb to be. Haya is an unusual verb, very, very rarely used like that. It is not, it does not have a tense, so it's tenseless. It's about existence, and it's about existence from the inside out, and it's not static. So it's about existence that's living and active, not static. So God responds to Moses, in effect, I am existence. That is an extraordinarily significant thing, even in the Hebrew world, but in today's context, when we get to Genesis 1, we're going to see how significant it is. So, understanding that revelation is from God, and that when he reveals himself, we're on holy ground, we begin at the beginning. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashemayim ve'et ha'aretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, you can barely say that without recognizing immediately there's a simplicity to it that is extraordinary. It's majestic. We're going to talk a little bit about Genesis 1 before we get into the science, but I want to have a, a short comment on the Bible and science. You know, the Bible is not a handbook of science. I agree with that. If it were, it would be millions of, of books long, so to speak. But that doesn't mean it doesn't have anything to say that touches the realm of the scientist. The fact that the primary purpose of Genesis is not to instruct us in cosmology does not exclude the reality that it has something relevant to say about that subject. So, what does Genesis 1 say about the creation of the universe and of life? Well, first of all, in the beginning, God. God in existence, in the fullness of that word. He was there eternally before anything else. He exists before space and time and therefore outside of it. And he exists immaterially, meaning not inconsequentially, but lacking in material form. He is spirit. So, in the beginning, God. What does God do? God creates. He does that in two ways in Genesis. He brings into existence and he fashions. So if we look at um, Genesis, the first part of Genesis, we see that he creates by bringing into existence the Hebrew word bara. He does that with the heavens and the earth, which is a phrase meaning everything. He does that with sea creatures and birds and he does that with man, mankind. That verb means an action taken by God. It's never used with anybody else. It only means an action take, taken by God, and it's an action taken by him without the use of material substance. That's a different verb that we're going to get to in just a minute. 36 out of 45 times it's used in the Old Testament, it relates to the creation of man or the universe. And once, poignantly, after David's confrontation with Nathan, when he's broken and repenting because of his adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband Uriah, David prays for a pure heart in Psalm 51.10. And he says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create is the word barach, which means David knows God can't refashion his heart. He has to make it anew. But it's also creation from nothing. Thomas Torrance, a Reformed Scottish theologian and a missionary kid, which I like, 
described it this way. The creation of the universe out of nothing does not mean the creation of the universe out of something that is nothing, but out of nothing at all. It's not created out of anything. It came into being through the absolute fiat of God's word in such a way that whereas previously there was nothing, the whole universe came into being. The interesting thing about this part of Genesis, and I'll, I'll restrict it to just man, God created man in two different ways. It's the only entity that he created that way. He created man by fashioning him out of the dust. We see that in Genesis 2. And by breathing God's spirit into him. So he created man out of something, but he breathed in something from nothing. So man is a component of God's actions using both verbs. The only time that appears in the entire Bible. So, how did he do that? Well, he spoke. Jesus. He created by spoken word. And he did it emphatically by using what? The verb that he used to describe his name to Moses. Hayah. Which is an, an, an emphatic command to whatever he says that to, to exist. So, for existence... Uh, for example, Genesis 1-3, literally interpreted, that means God said, exist light, and light existed. Chaya or, and light existed. And then he commanded uh, the vegetation to be made, the earth to make the vegetation. But he also did all that through Jesus. Um, you know, John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus was present at creation and a part of creation. In Corinthians, uh, um, it says the following. He, meaning Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And then this really uh, important statement that we'll talk about later today in the context of science. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. The Greek word there is sunistano, and it means to cohese. It means to hold things. So, so G, it, in Jesus, all things cohese together. So where are we? In the beginning, God exists, haya. God creates bara out of nothing, the universe and man. God fashions out of something, land dwellers and mankind. And he does this by spoken word through the word. So what does the Bible say about revelation of God in the world around us? Uh, psalm 19 is a great psalm. Go home and read it, the whole thing. I'm, I'm only dealing with part of it right here. But Psalm 19 is often referred to as the creation hymn. It's written by David. And here's what Psalm 19.1 says. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Now this psalm was written toward the end of David's life, about 3,000 years ago. And you can imagine David reflecting on the nights where he was running from Saul in a cave or wherever out in the wilderness, and he goes outside and he looks up at the stars. And he sees something in the stars that emphatically tells him that God is real and God exists. And he, it is so emphatic that when he writes it down, with, he didn't have a telescope, he didn't have a degree in cosmology, he wasn't a physicist, he just saw what he saw and he wrote it down. And he said the heavens, which is the same word in Genesis 1-1, and the sky, which is the same word in Genesis 1-6, declare and proclaim, meaning they state emphatically and authoritatively what? God's glory and handiwork. How often? 24-7, day and night, 
pour out, literally the Hebrew word here is gush speech and reveal knowledge. That is understood, important, shama, to hear, not only to hear, but to understand. So the focus here and elsewhere in the Bible is God communicates information to his creature in creation that is heard. Psalm 119.89 says, Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. So here's the key of this verse. Through what can be seen in unmistakable language that is understood, God communicates knowledge of himself, his glory. That's David. Let's look at Paul. Paul says essentially the same thing. He's talking about something a little bit different. Paul is writing about God's wrath in connection with the unrighteous who suppress the truth. And I think that truth suppression concept is really interesting because the Greek means that they physically hold something down. That's, that's an action of intent. That's not accidental. That's intentional suppression. So that's what he's talking about here. And he goes on and here's what he says. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Let's break that down. So since creation, the things that have been made provide knowledge about God's eternal power and divine made nature, which is and has been, one, shown to them, two, plain to them, and three, perceived by them. So they're out without excuse. So like David, perceiving God in what can be seen is inescapable. That's what the Bible says about revelation in creation. Well, let's turn to where we are today. I'll start off with a little bit, a little anecdote. And this anecdote is about Bertrand Russell, a British philosopher and atheist. He was asked one time what would happen if he died and God appeared to him and wanted to know why he had failed to believe. And he said, not enough evidence, God. Not enough evidence. That's incorporating an argument made by atheists, the argument from divine hiddenness. And what it basically says is, exactly what he said, if you just show yourself to me, I would believe you exist. And that does raise the question, why is God's existence not more obvious? Well, to start with, seeing is not always believing. As C.S. Lewis says in uh, Miracles of Preliminary Study, he talks about a woman who didn't believe in the soul or the afterlife, but she saw a ghost and having seen a ghost, he wanted to know if it changed her mind. She said, no, it was a trick or an illusion. And C.S. Lewis says, those who assume that miracles cannot happen are merely wasting their time by looking into the text. We know in advance what they're going to find. Or Richard Dawkins, um, who in 2012 was interviewed by ABC Australia, and he said, he was asked, what proof, by the way, would change your mind about not believing in God? And he said, that's a very difficult and interesting question because, I mean, I used to think, oh boy, excuse me a second, my computer's going to take this away from me. We back? We're back. Okay. Um, I used to think that if somehow, you know, a great big giant 900 foot Jesus with a voice like Paul Robeson suddenly strode in and said, I exist and here I am, but even that, I actually sometimes wonder if that would do it. And we can go right to the Bible, to John 10, uh, verse 24 through 26. So the Jews gathered around Jesus and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I, I told you, and you did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me but you do not believe because you're not among my sheep. So seeing is not necessarily believing. Second, Paul would say, well, it is obvious. Though, the, though God is invisible, we just went through the verses, 
it's obvious that he's clearly perceived. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, God has to keep room for there to be love. Freedom to love God is essential to genuine love of God. God gave humans the freedom not to love him. This isn't a time for a theological class on the paradox of free choice and election, which I'm sure Jeff would love if I dived into that. <laughs> but, but God does not compel love because genuine love cannot be compelled. And if he were to stand up in between, between Europe and America and just be there, what choice would you have, really? So let's turn to the universe itself. This is not quite as dramatic as it would be on a uh, TV screen, uh, but that is a dramatic picture taken by the Webb Telescope of a star group called Cassiopeia. This is a remnant of a supernova that collapsed and exploded 11,000 light years away from here. It first showed up about 300 years ago. And I show you that picture just to show you David couldn't have seen that. Paul couldn't have seen that. We can see that. And immediately what you see when you see that is beauty. You have to. Next week we're going to talk about why, it, why is it that we can perceive beauty. What is there about God's revelation that shows that? But I also want to say that um, knowledge today has advanced to the point that we're now at the peak of our understanding of the universe. There's more to learn, but the more we learn, the greater is God's revelation of himself in the universe. In fact, we're fast approaching the time, and I think in cosmology we're already there, where scientific discoveries have converged with ultimate truth. And we'll talk next week about that in the context of biology. We're very close there as well. And I also want to just throw out the concept of conflict between religion and science, and we'll talk about more next week. Understand, as Jeff has said before and others have said before, that all truth is God's truth. We know that intrinsically. But we can't help ourselves because there's this apparent conflict between science and religion. Uh, just, just as an aside, guess who first introduced man to science. God did. And how did he do that? Because he told Adam to name the animals. That's the science of taxonomy. That's classification. God introduced man to science. So he's definitely not afraid of science. Augustine says, nay, but let every good and true Christian understand that wherever truth be found, it belongs to his master. So science properly understood, religion properly understood, cannot conflict. So the origin of the universe. Well, as we've been talking for a while, the Bible has for millennia said that there was a beginning and there was a creator. Science has progressed over time. Uh, science began by the observation that, well, everything that we can see is unchanging, so it must have been there forever. And besides which, it's more appealing to think about not, or not having to think about a cause of that. It just existed. So we have Aristotle, we have Newton, we have Einstein and others who believe that the universe was static and infinite. But we also pe had people who were informed by their faith. Augustine, Christian philosophers, Muslim philosophers, Jewish philosophers, who saw a finite universe because that's what their faith told them there was. Well, today, we have a beginning, both theoretically and observationally. The universe is finite, and that began around 1920 to be discovered. Now, some of you have heard the phrase Big Bang, and we're going to talk about it today because that's the easiest way to refer to it. What is the Big Bang? Well, it's a term that Sir Fred Hoyle used to characterize the beginning of the universe. And the reason he did it, he says, is that uh, what was previously known as Friedman cosmology, who was the fellow who figured out that there probably was a beginning that we'll get to in a minute, gave it that name, Friedman cosmology. And 
Hoyle said, well, you, ha you have to have something vivid, so I thought up the Big Bang. So when you think of the word Big Bang, what do you think of? Probably that, right? Wrong. <laughs> Disabuse yourself of the notion, that I'll get to in a minute, that it must have been something like that, because it wasn't. And the fact that it wasn't is startling beyond belief and even more indication that God was behind it. So what is Big Bang cosmology? Now, the theory is that at some point in the distant past, space, time, matter, and energy began from a singularity. It rapidly expanded and today it's still expanding even faster than it had been before. The singularity is a physics concept that is non-observable except to the extent that you can see the, the evidence of it from a black hole, but it's non-observable. It's an infinite, a point of infinite mass, density, and curvature. And the interesting thing about that is that Hawking says, and he's right, the actual point of creation, he's talking about the singularity that he and others theorized began the, uh, was the beginning of the universe, is outside the presently known laws of physics, so it's not really visible. There's an important concept behind that that I'll share with those after here if you really want to, but that is that the causal joints of God's actions inside space-time are almost always not directly visible. There are reasons for that. The exception to that would be Jesus when he performed miracles. Now, you didn't actually see the inner workings of the body, the bone get healed or the leprosy. You saw the effect of it. But in Jesus' case, because he was God, you could actually see the cause and effect. But nowhere else can you see something like that in today's world. A uh, whole other issue for another day. So, what happened? Listen carefully. Between zero and one second, matter and energy appear from nothing. And a silent, dark, hot, exponentially fast, flat, smooth expansion occurs with uniform matter and energy density distribution. And simultaneously, all the physical laws are created. And all of this happens characterized by extreme order. And as, our, as, as Roger Penrose says, utterly extraordinary precision. So disabuse your minds of the concept that this is an explosion. You know what happens when things explode? Everything goes everywhere. Not so here. An extraordinarily ordered expansion, and the expansion was from 10 to the minus 32 seconds in that space of time. It expands to 10 to the 26. And then by 10 to the 53rd, it stops to keep it all from vanishing. So you have this explosive expansion that covers almost the entire universe in just a tiny point of time. And the startling thing about that is that it's all ordered. It's not disruptive. And we'll, we'll talk about the degree of that in a little bit. But let me, let me just give you a, just a few uh, peeks into where this took place and how it took place. So 10 to the minus 43 seconds is known as Planck time. Planck time is the smallest amount of time that physicists can actually think about. You can't go beyond it. The laws of physics don't allow you to do that. So they talk about Planck time both as a period of time and as a visual thing to, to physics. So at 10 to the minus 43 seconds, the Big Bang is in size 10 to the minus 35 meters. And it's, I had to look this up, it's at 100 nonillion degrees all matter and energy compressed like that. From 10 to the minus 43rd to one second, the four fundamental forces separate. Fundamental particles begin to form. The temperature cools to a balmy trillion degrees. From one second to three minutes, 
uh, anti-particle annihilation occurs. Photons are freed as energy, but they're still bound up because it's too hot for them to be visible. From three minutes to 20 minutes, atomic nuclei begin to form, creating hydrogen, helium, and lithium. Then from three minutes to 240,000 years, a plasma universe is dominated by photon radiation. Very hot, very um, opaque. Then around 380,000 years, from a hot, opaque plasma, now at a truly balmy 3,000 degrees Kelvin, something known as photon decoupling occurs. And for the first time since the Big Bang, the universe becomes transparent to light. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, I could go through the rest of this and carry on to the present day, but I won't because we don't have time. That is the sound created from temperature fluctuations that are captured in a moment that I'm going to show you in a minute of that period from 380,000 years to a million years. And what you could hear from that, this was done by a very complicated process uh, done out of the University of Washington about 10 years ago. Um, what you can hear from that is expansion. You heard a sound that was small growing to a sound that was bigger. So how did all this come about? How did we find out about all this? Well, the prevailing view in the 1920s with the, that the universe was static. But Einstein, in 1915, in his theory of general re relativity, created the framework for the discovery of the Big Bang. Einstein had some field equations that he used to uh, work with his formulation of general relativity, and some other physicists, particularly two of them, Alexander Friedman and George Lemaitre, who's a Catholic priest, took those and they actually synthesized the observational evidence about the galaxies moving farther and farther away with the theory of general rel relativity. I know this is boring you to death, but bear with me here. Uh, so they synthesized that and came to the conclusion that, well, the galaxies are moving farther and faster away. And what that meant was, well, at some point in the past, they had to be all together. So that was the foundational discovery that led cosmologists to start to look at, reluctantly, the idea that there was, in fact, a beginning of some time. But that didn't really seal the case. It wasn't until 1985 when two physicists with Bell Labs in New Jersey were playing around with their telescope, and they uh, noticed when they were trying to work with early satellites that there was this, this hum in the background they couldn't get rid of. And they first thought it might be pigeon droppings in the telescope. They cleaned those out. And that didn't turn out to solve the problem. But they were talking with their colleagues over at Rutgers, and they said, you know, there, there should be uh, a microwave background radiation from this Big Bang if it really happened. And they began to look at that more closely, and all of a sudden they figured out that's what the hiss was. It was the microwave background radiation. And for that discovery, they got the Nobel Prize in 1978. But the real kicker to that is this visual. This is the smoking gun. This is the first direct observational proof of a beginning. This is the microwave background radiation that was seen was, was first discovered in 1965, was uh, targeted by the uh, Cosmic Microwave Background Explorer that NASA used in the 80s, and then followed on by the Planck Explorer used by the Europeans in 1987, all designed to actually see this background radiation, which is around three degrees Kelvin, which is exactly what was predicted by the formula. And what you see here is the 
cosmic microwave background radiation from creation's first light. When the original hot plasma imprinted on the sky, this temperature gradient, when it was 380,000 years old. And you can see by looking at it that there are tiny variations in temperature shown up by differences in color. What is that? <laughs> That's the imprint of different densities that are the seeds of future stars and galaxies. So from the beginning, from first light, this was created with the seeds of the rest of creation of the universe in it. George Smoot, the director of the uh, Cosmic Background Explorer program, says that if you're religious, this is like seeing God. So there are a couple of other things that I'm going to get to, and I'm going to have to I'm going to have to move real fast. But let me just tell you that this didn't go down easily. There was scientific resistance. Sir Arthur Eddington in the 30s said, philosophically, the notion of a beginning of the present order is repugnant to me. I should like to find a genuine loophole. Albert Einstein even built in a fudge factor in the general relativity formula that would have shown that the universe either collapsed on itself or expanded until it went away so that it would be static because he was a, he was a, a, a static universe was his favorite. He later called that his biggest blunder. And there have been efforts throughout the time since the discovery of the Big Bang to create other theories, including one that Stephen Hawking developed himself using imaginary time which is a real interesting approach for somebody like that. But that's not the only thing. There is no real dispute today that there was a beginning. There, there are a lot of theories designed to say, well, but it came from this or that or something else, and we'll look at that in just a second, hopefully. But the second part of this that is also difficult for secular scientists to, to deal with is that the universe is extraordinarily fine-tuned for life. So Fred Hoyle says, it looks like a put-up job. Paul Davies, Sir Martin Rees, the, royal, the astronomer royal of Great Britain says, Whenever physicists, wherever physicists look, they see examples of fine tuning. And Stephen Hawking himself says, the remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been finally adjusted to make possible the development of life. What is fine tuning? When the universe was created, the physical laws were created with built-in mathematical constructs called con constants. The constants are there, but nobody really knows why. But what they do know is, if you mess with them, if you tweak them just a little bit, and there are about 30 of them, if you tweak them just a little bit, what happens? No life. They're all finally balanced in a state that nobody can really explain, but it does keep the universe observationally true. So what we see observationally can only happen if they are tuned in that way. And there are a lot of these, as I said. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip to um, I'm gonna skip to the last one since we're short on time. There's a gravitational constant, there's a cosmological constant, but the one that I want to skip to is uh, entropy. Um, how many people in here like to have a well-made bed? <laughs> how, how, how many people sometimes may like it, but they don't do it? Because there are not many admit that. I'm going to raise my hand. Okay. So entropy. Entropy is a measure of disorder. So, an unmade bed has a high entropy. A made-up bed has a low entropy. Water has high entropy. Ice has low entropy. The staggering thing about the creation of the universe, and it is so staggering that it's almost beyond our ability to actually discuss it. You run out of adjectives. But the staggering thing is that the universe, with this rapid expansion, was done like an exquisitely made up bed. It was in exquisite order, which was necessary for the second law of thermodynamics to exist. Had it not been that way, we wouldn't be around. Roger Penrose, who is uh, an atheist, 
said tongue in cheek, how big was the original phase space volume W that the creator had to aim for in order to provide a universe compatible with the second law of thermodynamics and what we now observe? Look at this number. One part in 10 to the 10th to the 123rd. No number exists like that in the entire universe. In fact, he said this, even if we were to write a zero on each separate proton and on each separate neutron in the entire universe, and we could throw in all the other particles as well for good measure, we should fall far short of writing down the figure. In fact, he drew in one of his books an image of a creator touching this precise spot at the creation moment, and he said, called it an extraordinarily precise tuning was inherent in the Big Bang because there was an absurdly low entropy, utterly extraordinary precision in the creation of the universe. Mind you, this is an atheist. He's an honest atheist. I mean, he, he doesn't go around creating things just to argue like some others we know do. So, what's been the reaction? Well, I, I don't think I can say it any better than this. L Richard Lewontin, a Harvard evolutionary biologist and atheist, said in 1997, we take the side of science in spite of the patent, patent absurdity of some of its constructs, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. You see what's going on here? This is truth suppression. We've known about it ever since the Apostle Paul wrote about it. This is not new. That's what this is. And it comes principally today in two mechanisms. One, a multiverse. The problem with the multiverse is that it's a mathematical construct that exists in that tiny period of space that's, that physics can't play with before 10 to the minus 43 seconds. And it depends on math. But it depends on math with the input of human intelligence to get the formula right, which kind of begs the question. If you have to have intelligent math, where'd the intelligence come from? <laughs> hmm. uh, Roger Penrose, again, says the multiverse is an excuse for not having a good theory. It makes for good fiction. Well, then the other thing that they've come up with is, well, the universe created itself from itself, uh, from nothing. As Lawrence Krauss says, the word nothing means a lot of different things to people, right? John Lennox says, X creates Y, I'm okay with that. X creates X, that's pure nonsense. So, where are we? This is what Paul Jastrow, an astrophysicist who's an agnostic said in 1978. For the scientist who's lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He scaled the mountains of ignorance He's about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he's greeted by a band of theologians who've been sitting there for <laughs> centuries. Within less than a second, where there was nothing else, matter and energy appear in a new space-time and immediately and exponentially expand in a flat, smooth, extremely ordered way which is characterized by a bevy of constants in new physical laws that preserve what was set in motion with precision allowing life to exist. There are only three explanations for this. Chance, another universe creating mechanism, or an intelligent being. The probabilities, as we saw earlier, eliminate chance. And all the alternative mechanisms still require the input of intelligence into the math used to hypothesize their unobservable existence. David said, the heavens declare God's handiwork. And Paul said that God's eternal power and divine nature, though invisible, are clearly perceived. God, who is existence itself, has created all that exists. And in Jesus, it all, all holds together. And all for us. We're back where we started. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Let's pray. 
I thank you, Father, that wherever we go, as the psalmist said, if I ascend to the heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Thank you for this time to look at your creation, even in the place where we are today, where we can see in the smallest crevices of the universe, and yet, even there, you are there. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that's a fantastic way for us to prepare as we go into worship this morning, as we prepare to go into church because that is who we go to worship, the one who did all of this. Alan, that was absolutely extraordinary. Thank you. And um, one of the things that I learned that I never really thought about is that if you want to live a godly life, make your bed. <laughs> we'll see you in church. <laughs>